Hi, welcome to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White and today's lesson is on entropy and heat. We're going to talk about entropy disorder and its relationship to heat. We'll talk about the second and third laws of thermodynamics and the third law gives us an absolute scale for entropy. We'll talk about entropy as a driving force for chemical reactions and we'll talk about how to calculate reaction entropies. And finally we'll consider the Gibbs free energy thermodynamic state function and how it relates to equilibrium. Now we've already seen that heat uh, is energy that's statistically distributed among all molecular deg degrees of freedom, both kinetic uh, energy and potential energy. And we're going to introduce a new thermodynamic state function called entropy that's associated with heat. And uh, the definition of a change in entropy for any system is equal to the heat that's added to the system during some uh, reversible isothermic process divided by the temperature of that isothermal process. And uh, to be even more general, we can consider a differential form of this equation where the differentially small amount of change of entropy is equal to a differential amount of heat added in a reversible process divided by the temperature. And so now we can generalize this to include uh, processes that are reversible but not necessarily isothermal by integrating the right hand side so that if we integrate dq reversible divided by t and add up all those little changes in in entropy, which might be different because the temperature, temperature is changing, the integral of all of those uh, differential changes in entropy is delta S for this overall non-isothermal process. Now to illustrate uh, how the relationship between entropy and disorder, we can consider a marching band. And a marching band has a relatively low entropy configuration because all the members of the band are in exactly their assigned places and when the band marches it all goes in the same direction at the same time. And that's analogous to a molecular crystal where all the uh, molecules are lined up and go in the same direction at the same time. A crowd of people on the other hand has a relatively high entropy because people move around and exchange places and um, are not necessarily in an assigned place. And so this is analogous to a gas or a liquid where molecules are constantly bumping into each other and moving around and changing places. The second law of thermodynamics says um, that any spontaneous, that is to say irreversible process, will tend to increase the entropy of the universe, that is to say um, the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. And we're going to see that entropy is an important thermodynamic driving force for chemical reactions. And it's the combination of entropy and enthalpy that govern whether or not reactions will proceed spontaneously from reactants to products or perhaps the other way around. Around. Now the third law of thermodynamics, which is stated by G. N. Lewis in 1923, says that the entropy of any pure perfectly crystalline solid at the absolute zero of temperature is equal to zero. And so unlike enthalpy, the scale of entropy has an absolute reference. And so we don't need to use uh, an, a relative scale like we do with enthalpy, where we set the elements uh, to be zero. Um, here, the entropy of any perfectly uh, crystalline solid is uh, zero at absolute zero. So I've listed a lot of elements in this chart according to their periodic group uh, and I've listed at the bottom solid elements, uh, in the middle monatomic gases, and uh, above that molecular gases uh, for the elements. And you can see that within, within each column, within each group, um, the entropy of a substance increases with mass. So lithium has a relatively low entropy, um, whereas cesium has a relatively high entropy. The uh, monatomic gases have higher entropies in general than the solids, and the molecular gases have higher entropies than the monatomic gases in general. But all of these things lie somewhere between zero and about 300 joules per mole per kelvin. Now for very complex uh, polyatomic molecules, the entropies are going to be even higher, but for ordinary diatomic molecules, um, uh, solids and gases, you can expect that entropies will generally lie somewhere in, in the range below 300 joules per mole per kelvin. So entropy depends on phase, temperature, mass, and molecular structure. 
Third law entropies are tabulated just like enthalpies and usually in the same table. And we just have to remember that the entropies of elements are not zero, except for the special case of the crystal at absolute zero. Uh, aqueous ions are in fact listed with relative entropies, but that's a technical thing having to do with the fact that you can't experimentally measure uh, the entropy of an isolated ion. And so the entropy of reaction is calculated by taking the entropies of the products and subtracting that, um, subtracting the entropy of reactants, just like we did with enthalpy. So here's an example for the reaction of hydrogen and oxygen to produce water. We just take the entropies of liquid water, two moles now, and we have to use the stoichiometric coefficients like we did before, and we subtract the entropy of oxygen gas and twice the molar entropy of hydrogen gas uh, to get an overall delta S for the reaction of minus 326.6 joules per mole per Kelvin. Now watch your units uh, because entropies are usually tabulated in joules per mole per Kelvin, but enthalpies are given in kilojoules per mole, and so we might have to uh, do a conversion to uh, keep track of the kilojoules. There are two important thermodynamic driving forces for reaction that determine the spontaneity of reaction. Enthalpy is one of them, and we already know that heat releasing or exothermic reactions favor the formation of products. Entropy uh, is uh, also a driving force, and increasing entropy or disorder favors the formation of products. So the Gibbs free energy is a thermodynamic state function that balances the effects of enthalpy and entropy for chemical reactions. G is equal to H minus TS, so delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, and uh, we've made the restriction uh, that we're considering constant temperature and pressure, so we don't have to worry about the delta T term. If delta G for a reaction is less than zero, then that reaction favors uh, the formation of products spontaneously. If delta G is greater than zero, then the reaction favors the spontaneous formation of reactants, and so it's just the opposite. And if delta G is equal to zero, then the reaction is at equilibrium and doesn't favor the spontaneous formation of either products or reactants. So let's take a, a look at a spontaneous reaction um, of two moles of hydrogen plus oxygen gives two moles of liquid water. We've seen that the delta H for this reaction is um, minus 571,600 joules per mole, where I've converted from kilojoules. The delta S is minus 326.6 joules per mole per Kelvin. And so delta G is delta H minus T delta S, and so I can calculate that to be minus 474,224. 474,224 joules per mole. Notice that enthalpy favors the formation of products, but entropy favors the, um, the formation of reactants in this case. So the two driving forces for reaction are opposite in uh, their direction, but in this case uh, the change in enthalpy is much, much larger, and so the Gibbs free energy formation, when we put everything together, favors the formation of products. So next time we'll consider equilibrium, we'll consider the mass, the law of mass action, uh, which tells us which way a reaction will go spontaneously toward reactants or toward products, and we will consider Le Chatelier's principle, which uh, talks about the response of a system uh, when it's disturbed from equilibrium in some way.